very much. Uh, right, we are uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so I think most of you probably are familiar with us, but just uh, briefly, we are a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. We fight for privacy, for free speech, for fair use of intellectual property rights. We try and make a future that you would want to live in, and we do this uh, through, uh, through litigation from our uh, teams of uh, lawyers. Uh, I am a lawyer at EFF. I should introduce myself, I guess, uh, actually. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the uh, general counsel and deputy executive director at, at EFF. Um, and we do this through our, uh, uh, also through our activist team, try and raise grassroots support, get people politically active on uh, digital issues, and through our technologists uh, who uh, try and come up with awesome software that will help uh, enhance digital freedom. Uh, so we're going to uh, go down the line here and have everybody uh, in introduce uh, themselves uh, and say uh, a few words about uh, what, what has been going on over the last year and what have they been uh, uh, up to. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of uh, EFF's legal, uh, legal efforts uh, over the last year. And there's been a, a number of things, probably too many to really highlight. There's only a few that I wanted to point out. So one, which is uh, uh, big news uh, recently, uh, as I say, yesterday, uh, we filed a lawsuit uh, against the, uh, the US government, against the Library of Congress and Department of Justice uh, concerning the uh, 1201 uh, restrictions on what you can do with, uh, uh, for hacking uh, and circumventing copyrighted uh, protected materials. Right, thank you. Uh, very exciting uh, lawsuit, and because 1201 is an extremely problematic law. This was passed as part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, uh, and uh, it was sort of a recognition by the uh, the copyright uh, industries that they were they were failing at providing technology that would be able to secure their devices, that, that uh, DRM was not working very well at a technical level, and so uh, they wanted to use their, their uh, advantage in uh, Congress through their, their intensive lobbying efforts uh, to uh, skew the playing field and to make it illegal to do something that would circumvent uh, digital rights management technology uh, so that they wouldn't have to try as hard on the technical front. Uh, and they, they, so they passed this 1201 and people said at the time, hey, you know, this, this is a big problem. What about fair uses? What about legitimate uses? You're, this, is, this is overly broad. And so the legislature said, well, we'll have an exemption thing. So if you think it's being misused, if it's going overly broad, you can claim this exemption. Uh, go to the Library of Congress every three years and file a petition to say how it's been bad, uh, and then maybe you'll get an exemption. And so that's been going on since 1998. Every three years, uh, we ask for, for exemptions, uh, and you know some of them have been granted, and, and, and that has been great, but many of them have not been. Uh, and there still are these restrictions, unless you get one of these things, uh, you're still prohibited, even if uh, it would be fully protected speech uh, that ordinarily, under our tradition of uh, free expression, would be allowed. Uh, and then even if you get one, it goes away after three years. You have to reapply or, or the exemption's no good. And this doesn't really square with the principles of free expression that we've had in this country. Uh, you shouldn't have to apply to the government for a license in order to engage in, in protected activities. Um, so we're trying to bring those principles to bear and get the courts to agree that uh, Section 1201 goes too far, hurts too much expression, and isn't the right balance. Uh, a couple other things uh, to, to talk about. Um, uh, another is um, the, uh, our, our cases against uh, the government for uh, national security letters and also for the warrantless surveillance program. We have ongoing litigation uh, on, on all of these, uh, these fronts. Uh, right now, I'm working on a, a national security letter case, trying to bring it to uh, get a court of appeal to agree that national security letters and the gags that accompany them are unconstitutional, that they shouldn't be automatically prohibited from speaking by something which is issued without court involvement from the FBI. Uh, so that, we're, we're setting the briefing schedule now, and that's going before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal uh, over the next year. 
Uh, and uh, another area, one of the lines, things I uh, work on is our coders' rights project. This is where we try and protect security researchers and allow those research to be able to do their research, talk about their research, be able to enhance security by providing more information about vulnerabilities. Uh, and one of the major barriers to being able to do that is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the federal anti-hacking statute, and it has for many years had a number of problems. It has uh, very extreme uh, uh, penalties. Um, and uh, has some, some broad interpretation. So uh, just uh, uh, quickly a little bit of, of news on what's been going on there. Uh, there have been a couple of cases that have come out in the, uh, uh, this, uh, this spring and summer um, that are somewhat uh, uh, noteworthy. One is uh, the Nozel case. Uh, and this case has actually been around for a while. It has had various rulings. It has had a very good ruling a while back uh, that determined that uh, violating terms of use was didn't make uh, you uh, into uh, a federal criminal hacker. Uh, you know, this uh, under under one interpretation, the DOJ's interpretation of, of this law, uh, access without authorization uh, was hacking, and so therefore, if uh, if a site had uh, you must be 18 to visit this site, and uh, like Seventeen magazine did, uh, and you went there and you were 17. Uh, you would be committing a felony. Um, and so uh, that case confirmed that uh, uh, if you go to a site and you just violate the uh, terms of use, uh, that in and of itself is not, uh, is not a crime. This is very good. But the two recent cases made some uh, adjustments to that which are uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, disturbing. So um, in, the, in the Nozel case, um, in addition to uh, violating the, in that case it was an employment uh, agreement, but a, you know, functional equivalent to the terms of use for what you could do with the system, uh, there's also password sharing. So uh, uh, Nozel and his colleagues had obtained the password of an employee of this organization. They had the password with permission of the password holder um, and uh, uh, used that and the court determined that that was a violation of the anti-hacking statute. They didn't believe that you had to actually do a technical hack, you didn't have to defeat a technical protection system, but that sharing a password would be enough. Um, and while I, I uh, you know, obviously they were very uh, upset with what uh, Nozel had, had done there, uh, but there's a lot of widespread ramifications in this case which could be dangerous uh, and that we're very concerned about because there are a lot of cases where people might want to share a password that, uh, you know, if a, a couple, uh, uh, one, one wants to uh, share passwords to the other so they can take care of some banking, uh, this shouldn't be a federal crime. There are many instances in which, with the authority and permission of the account holder, you should be able to use the account and not being uh, uh, subject to the prosecutorial discretion, the question of whether or not the government will decide to go after you when they could go after you if you wanted to, because we saw how badly that worked when the government went after uh, Aaron Swartz uh, many years ago, and we're asking for many years in prison for doing something that uh, ultimately the, uh, the so-called victim of it didn't have a big problem with. Uh, and then uh, the second uh, big decision uh, recently uh, was uh, Power Ventures, uh, Facebook versus Power Ventures. Uh, in that case, on, on the plus side, uh, it did acknowledge and reaffirm that merely violating the, uh, the terms of use was not enough to make it into a CFAA violation, uh, but they also said that if you had been specifically told not to go to a site, uh, in that case they had sent a, a letter, a cease and desist letter, said stop using our site, you're not allowed here anymore, uh, go away, uh, that continuing to use it uh, could be uh, could be hacking, and again, without having to get around any uh, 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 serious technical measures to do so. Uh, I think this this could be also a very dangerous uh, ruling because uh, it, it it sets up a, a lot of possibilities where somebody through through sending a letter could elevate a civil dispute, a, a thing that would ordinarily be determined by uh, parties in a civil court going over disputes of contract uh, into a criminal matter and criminalization of the these laws is not is not the where the future that we want to live in. So that's just a little bit of what's been going on uh, in the legal world, and I'll turn it over to my colleague Parker. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Parker Higgins. I'm on the activism team at EFF. Uh, it's super cool that EFF has an activism team, um, and a lot of what we do is we uh, bring 
uh, we, we bring the issues that we're working on and that we care about and that you care about out to the people and we figure out uh, what, the, what the best place uh, for a lot of interested people, a lot of you know, interested hackers and people who develop software and people who have a voice and people who may vote, uh, the, the best thing that they can do. Um, uh, the thing that I'm super excited about right now, Kurt just mentioned it, um, this lawsuit that we filed yesterday, uh, I, Kurt got a round of applause for it. I don't, um, uh, it's, <laughs> so, uh, we work on 1201 issues all the time. We work on DRM issues all the time. Uh, this is really the, the sort of most direct frontal challenge we can launch. And I think a really important part of this is not just filing the lawsuit, but highlighting the issues and bringing this out to the people. And so that's, uh, what I envision doing over, you know, uh, not just when we launch, but these things take a lot of time, um, like a like sometimes a depressingly long time, uh, and so uh, so we have to keep uh, keep people updated and 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 uh, keep people aware of what's going on as that progresses. Um, and then the other thing, of course, that we don't do through impact litigation is uh, is policy stuff. So. One of the big copyright issues that we work on is uh, fair use on platforms like, like YouTube, um, where uh, the law is is pretty clear about about things being fair use. Uh, but uh, if if content ID flags it, then it bumps you out of the the legal system and then bumps you into the the content ID track. Um, and I don't know if people, if anyone, by the way, uh, just for reference, the lighting in here is such that I cannot see anything going on. So if there's a glimmer of recognition from, from YouTube, I, I have uh, no idea. Um, so uh, I don't know if people are, are YouTube users, but um, people who upload videos complain about this all the time, that their videos get taken down or they can't um, put ads on them or all sorts of things because of content ID. And you can't, there isn't really an avenue to sue over that, um, which is our, our preferred uh, problem solving method. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so, so you know, this is this is working with companies and putting public pressure uh, to to try to change policies that way. And we've got a couple of projects um, to do that sort of thing uh, that hopefully come up in questions. I, I want to move it along a little bit so that we can so we can get to the part that y'all are interested in. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's that's what the activism team does. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions, not just about the copyright stuff that I mostly work on, but our activism around uh, policy and legislation on uh, surveillance issues and other things like that. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name's Vivian. I'm a software engineer at EFF. Um, I'm part of EFF's web development team. So I build sites and tools that support EFF's projects and I also maintain EFF.org. Um, and that's really cool because I get to touch a little bit of everything that EFF does. Um, supporting the projects that activism does and that our tech projects team does. So um, I'm just going to talk about a few of the projects that I've worked on recently. Um, one was to build a web landing page for uh, our CertBot project, which um, I think Jacob will probably talk a little more about. But um, CertBot is a tool that makes it easy to get a certificate through Let's Encrypt and install it. Um, and ease of use is a really important part of that project, so we wanted to make a site that would also make it really easy. So we still have the full documentation, but we built a little widget where users can input um, the web server operating system and the server that they're using and get tailored instructions at sort of the level of detail that they're looking for. Um, so that was cool. Um, Another project that I worked on recently is uh, a small site about street level surveillance technologies. So EFF of course does a lot of work opposing surveillance at the national level, but we're also doing some work opposing surveillance at the local level with uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, and there's a lot of uh, surveillance that goes on at the local level and a lot of it is done in secret, so we wanted to make that information more public. And we launched with a focus on two technologies, which are automat automatic license plate readers, which um, can read your license plate number and the location where it is, um, and biometrics, which are sort of unique uh, biological identifiers that people have. Um, and we put together some cool infographics and some pretty extensive FAQs and resources for legal professionals. 
Um, and then for biometrics, we actually did a cool project where we um, crowdsourced FOIA requests. So we, um, since this stuff is so secretive, um, there's not a ton of information about how it's being used across the country. So we asked users to submit public records requests to um, their local law enforcement and get information and share it with EFF so that we could aggregate that information and get a better picture of what's going on. Um, and we're getting ready to add stingrays, which are also known as uh, cell site simu simulators, um, to the information on that site. Um, we're going to have a bunch of resources about that too. Um, cell site simulators are used by law enforcement to track uh, cell phone use. Um, and then uh, the third project that I've been working on recently is our Action Center. So that's um, an open source platform for political organizing. So it's a tool that's mostly used by Parker's team. Um, so instead of having to come to web dev when they want to do a campaign and say, hey, we need a site about this thing. Can you build us a website that lets users engage in this way? They can spin up an action on their own that can do things like uh, help users call Congress. Um, so they'll learn about an issue and then be able to engage on that issue. Um, and it's open source, so um, other organizations can use it. We'd love it if other nonprofits used this tool. Um, and what I'm working on with that right now is building out some student organizing functionality. So um, EFF is pushing to do more grassroots work where we are a hub for an action, but um, we're engaging with organizations around the country who are, are spearheading it at the local level. And part of that is more on-campus organizing. So um, what we would like to be able to do is um, run a campaign um, nationally and then allow uh, on-campus university groups to uh, petition their university to take a particular action like agree not to sell any patents that come out of their research to patent trolls. So um, that's what I've been working on most recently and it's something that I'm really excited about. Um, I'm interested in nonprofit technology and nonprofit web development in general. Um, I like talking about that. I'm Jacob Hoffman Andrews. Uh, Parker said that our favorite way of solving problems is to sue, and I think that's true, <laughs> but we do have two backup plans to other approaches to problem solving. One is to write code, uh, and the other is to write blog posts. Um, I'm one of EFF's technologists, uh, and so that means I'm a multi-class researcher slash activist slash coder. Um, and uh, my biggest current project is called Let's Encrypt, and this falls under EFF's. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this falls under EFF's uh, long-running Encrypt the Web project, which has been going since I think at least 2010. Um, I know Parker has spoken a number of times on encrypting the web and has put together our um, Encrypt the Web scorecard. Uh, and so we made a lot of progress there by writing words and saying, you know, you should do this. If you have a website, you should encrypt it. You should use HTTPS. Um, but we also found a lot of websites were stymied by the difficulty of setting up HTTPS on their website. It was expensive and it was time consuming and a lot of people just didn't necessarily know how to do it even beyond the cost, which was coming down, the skills needed to figure out how to submit a request and how to prove you own a site, how to install that in your web server was too high a barrier. Um, so we dreamed of this notion of a certificate authority that would not only give you your certificates for free, but would allow you to automate the process. You could just run one command, your whole website is HTTPS. Uh, so uh, we put our noses to the grindstone and we made it happen. Um, Let's Encrypt launched in December of last year. Uh, we've issued, f we have four and a half million active certificates covering somewhere north of eight million host names. You know, what you, could, you could think of a, a website. Um, and along with Let's Encrypt the service, the certificate authority, we launched CertBot, which is uh, a client for the, that API. Um, and Vivian mentioned the awesome website that uh, the um, web development team set up for CertBot. It's, if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. It leads you through exactly what you need to do based on what operating system you have, what server you have, uh, and leads you through the install process. Um, if uh, you're interested in Let's Encrypt, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon I'll be giving a workshop uh, on integrating Let's Encrypt, writing clients, 
et cetera. Uh, and Sunday morning, I'll be giving a talk on Let's Encrypt for Progress so far. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention another interesting project, more on the write blog post side. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we sounded the alarm on Verizon's uh, UIDH header tracking, where they would actually you know, reach into your packets and edit them and uh, insert this unique header so that sites could use that as a token to identify you and request even more data from Verizon. Uh, and it was a tough battle, and there was a lot of twists and turns in it, and it didn't look like Verizon was going to budge. But this year, uh, Verizon and the FCC reached an agreement to do exactly what we had asked for, which was to say, this is purely an opt-in feature. It's so invasive to add this tracking header to all of your traffic that uh, you have to affirmatively say, yes, I want this, before they'll start doing that. So I think that was a great victory on that front. <laughs> and now I think we'll turn it over to questions. Yes, very good. So uh, now this is the portion where we answer your questions. Uh, so uh, feel free. There's a microphone there in the center aisle, so we can line up in front of that microphone, and we'll we'll take you in order. Uh, <clears throat> just a, a couple of words before before we begin on the question, give people time to to get ready. Um, one of the things that we do is we provide uh, legal advice to people about their particular situations, uh, but this is not the time for those questions. You want to have uh, attorney-client privilege when you're asking those questions, so you know, if you're going to be uh, wondering if what you did is a violation of the law, let's have that be a private conversation. Um, and uh, we will be around here and, and we can have uh, other conversations over the course of the weekend. But uh, with that said, uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to ask about uh, EFF, our work, and, and the digital future. So uh, please uh, begin. Thanks. The uh, EFF makes the news an awful lot, usually in um, cooperation with a lot of other um, acronyms and, and people that, stuff that organizations that people are usually more familiar with, like the ACLU. So sometimes I'll point this out and they'll say, well, who the heck's EFF? So how should we describe the EFF to the non-computer person? Uh, usually I say they're kind of the ACLU of the internet, but that, I mean, I realize you guys have been around like forever since, you know, since it was cowboy land out there. So how, how would you like the, what's a good expl explanation of how do we describe the EFF to the general public who might not be that computer savvy? So if I could start out, um, you know, uh, we know a bunch of folks at the ACLU, we're fairly close to them, and uh, that is a, an easy way to describe what we do, but they would definitely say, well, but the ACLU is the ACLU of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they do actually have a very strong dot, dot rights program, and they recently filed a lawsuit to challenge uh, the CFAA on the grounds that it makes it difficult, it actually makes it criminal for researchers to try and investigate bias in machine learning algorithms. Um, so, you know, when I describe EFF, I usually say, you know, kind of the specific topic areas we work on. We defend privacy and free speech online and innovation and many, many other things. Parker, you look like it. Yeah. So, so, so I, uh, not to pick on the, everyone does say ACLU of the internet, so I, <laughs> I've thought about this a lot, not to pick on that phrasing. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, is that a lot of our work doesn't have anything to do with the internet. Um, like this 1201 lawsuit, one of the, one of the high profile things is that, um, because it, uh, because 1201 creates restrictions around any t uh, like access uh, control measure on any copyrighted work, this includes embedded software. And so, um, so your tractor, if you're a farmer, now has embedded software. And and um, John Deere came to the came to the exemption process and said, no, we don't think there should be an exemption because we don't want people to be able to repair their tractors. Um, and so, like this is like when it when it comes to defending people's right to tinker with their tractor, it just doesn't have anything to do with the internet anymore. Um, and uh, and so I I like to think that it's it's all technology, really. That it's that we're making sure your civil liberties uh, survive a collision with technology. Um, and uh, and yeah, that that sort of covers it. Although I, <laughs> if you're trying to explain it to a non-technical friend, that uh, might not uh, might not exactly do it for them, um, but yeah, there's it really is um, even in the five years that I've been there, and certainly in the in the 26 years that EFF's been around, uh, the border sort of crossed us, and now we work on a lot of issues that uh, that used to be 
uh, where we used to be niche and for the people in this room, now it's, it's kind of everybody in society is affected by the stuff we work on. Yeah, it's definitely something that um, my team has been talking about a lot because we would like people to be able to come to EFF.org and instantly understand what we do, which is really hard. Um, I think definitely um, I would echo what uh, Parker and Jacob said. And also, I found it helpful to talk about the type of work that we do um, because I think um, the legal work with, that we do um, is like uh, really helpful to draw a parallel to ACLU. But, um, and I think they probably do some activism similar to what your team does. Um, I think also our tech tools are something that um, people are really excited about. So I'll often talk about, you know, we do this legal work and we do this on the ground activism and we also have these awesome uh, tech tools. I do like, I like explaining to your friend, oh yeah, they're, they're a group that uh, sues the government and has a browser extension. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, Speaking of which, well, if I can like jump in. Question or? Oh, well, I just wanted to mention one of the really cool projects we launched on the Tech Projects team this year is a Privacy Badger. Um, and two browser extensions, sorry. Two browser <laughs> extensions. <laughs> and yeah, you can hear all about uh, a Privacy Badger, I think, in this room in uh, the session after next time. Um, anyway, shall we get to the next question, please? Uh, thanks, guys, for doing this panel. This is really interesting. Uh, my question was about what's the hardest part about getting uh, like public outcry and public action about things like SOPA? Is it like getting... Uh, like general news media outlets to pay attention, or is it like getting people to actually call their senators? What's the most difficult part of that process? Um, well, so with SOPA, it was pretty easy. <laughs> uh, but generally, yeah, it's generally it's really hard. Um, with the news media, a thing that I, this is like, a, you know, insider tips. Uh, until you have an image, like, like the TV won't cover it, and like newspapers won't cover it. And so one of the, one of the like things in retrospect, when we had you know Wikipedia blacked out and Google blacked out and these sites like that that literally you could take a screenshot of that could be B-roll, um, that was the thing that, that launched it up to the next level. But yeah, I think that um, uh, one of the hardest things is that with a lot of these issues, again with SOPA, it was it was so egregious and so poorly packaged. It was just not made to withstand any sort of public scrutiny. It was just supposed to be you know shuttled through. Uh, from you know directly from the MPAA through through uh, Congress, um, a lot of times there is a better public face on it, or a lot of times it's not clear. Like 1201, I I do have to say like this uh, affects like not just mashup films, but also tractors and also uh, you know voting machines and and these you know medical devices and finding that thread and explaining to people what the connection is. Is hard, and without that, yeah, getting them to pick up their phone and, and call for for legislative change or whatever it is is, is tricky. And uh, Parker, is this a good time to mention the EFA? Um, yeah, sure. So uh, the <laughs> uh, so one of the one of the ways that we're working on this, um, and Vivian mentioned before, some of some of our uh, move to to grassroots uh, to to um, working with local groups. Uh, is an alliance um, of, of mostly student groups and local groups. The yeah. EFA, which is the Electronic Frontier Alliance? Is that what? Okay. Yeah. Whew. Um, <laughs> you know, you get up here and it's... Uh, and, yeah, and so that is really... It, it's, there's no substitute for uh, talking directly with someone who knows the issues a little better than you do. Um, and so we're trying to build out that network. And we, we've been... Already we've been having some success building out that network of of the connected points all over the country and you know hopefully all over the world um, and there are regular meetings and we have we have video calls and it's it's uh, it's definitely something that is uh, that's working to get that kind of connection all right sir hi um, I believe Vivian was talking about stingrays and license plate readers which is what my kind of question is about I understand basically how these things are used to target individuals. But I'm just wondering if you guys could talk in whatever level of detail you'd like to as how like the Ring of Steel that's here in lower Manhattan where just anybody who goes below a certain street, their license plate is just captured and it's stored for whatever, three years. Like how does that not run afoul of the Fourth Amendment? And the same thing with dirt boxes, which is like the super uh, stingray that they put 
in planes and then just randomly go over neighborhoods or when there's a protest so they can track movements like is there some specific exemption in the Patriot Act that started this and it's just never been challenged legally how is this how is this legal <laughs> how could it how could it be well I, I can tell you a little bit of what where the uh, the government stands on on this issue uh, as, as you might imagine I don't always agree with them but I can at least uh, try to explain what their their position uh, is on a lot of these these technologies uh, and I, I put these in sort of the broad category of, uh, of technologies that take something that previously uh, a police officer could do manually, like they could walk around Lower Manhattan with a notepad and write down license plate numbers, um, and they could they could you know follow somebody, uh, they could take a picture of somebody with it with a camera, um, and then um, in their view, it's multiplication by by zero. Uh, if it was okay, if there was zero problem with a single uh, person doing it uh, once, then if you did it uh, uh, for everybody all the time, 24-7, then you've just multiplied by, by zero, and so you continue to, to not have uh, a problem with it. Um, and then it starts to get more, you know, ubiquitous, so our, you know, with, with uh, stingrays, like, well, these things are just traveling off the airways, and there we are, you know, we're, we're just uh, checking out what's on the, on the airways, what's the problem with that? Um, and I think that the uh, Supreme Court has actually uh, had a couple of decisions which have, um, well, they've been promising, but they haven't resolved the, the issues. And um, for example, there was a, a decision concerning uh, tracking somebody who was using a GPS tracker, um, and uh, uh, you know the government made these arguments that well, it's okay to track this person with a GPS tracker because um, you know uh, we, we could send someone to follow them, and it doesn't matter that there was previously a practical limitation of what we can do. We should be able to take all the advantage of new technologies uh, to use them to the maximum effect. Uh, and during the, during the argument there, they, they, the justices were somewhat uh, incredulous of this. They were like, so you're trying to tell me that if you just wanted to follow me, you know, to, to track me, put a GPS tracker on my car, wherever I go, you could do that, and uh, no, no warrant would be required, no, no court order, uh, you could just do that, and they, they had to say, well, yes, right, they, they, that was their position. Um, and, uh, well, they, 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 the decision came out that that was a problem in that, in that case. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a convoluted case, so there, there, there were different, different opinions on it. But it set the stage, I think, for, for further challenges as the courts were starting to recognize that uh, when, you, when you take things at, at scale, you make them ubiquitous, they, they do it all the time, you have a different set of societal problems and that, that we shouldn't change the world that we're living in to one more of a dystopian surveillance state just because the technology for doing so is super cheap. I also want to just add one quick thing, which is if the if the question broadly was how is this legal, um, yeah, I think I, sometimes it's not, and that's you know, and, and then we sue, and so just because the government is doing it uh, doesn't, I, I think that that they would say that makes it legal. That's you know, that's how we decide yeah, what to do. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And to be very very clear, exactly, uh, I was explaining what the government's position is, and I think that. Uh, uh, we have continued to challenge some of these things, um, and not only on the Fourth Amendment, which you mentioned, for, for requiring uh, uh, a, uh, uh, reasonable searches and warrants and such, uh, but also under the right of association, that it's been long established that you have the right to associate with people, uh, and you can do so without the government knowing who you're associating with, uh, and some of these technologies actually make that very difficult to do. Uh, and and uh, subject challenge under that amendment, on the First Amendment. And to maybe answer a little of the underlying question of how do we stop this, uh, there was another really good pan um, talk panel earlier about police use of surveillance techniques, and uh, they raised the point that it's much, much easier to stop new surveillance technologies from entering into your local police department's arsenal before it happens. You know, if you can spot this at the town council level or figure out that you're local police are gonna start doing this, it's much easier to fight it there than after it's already deployed, trying to get it rolled back. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for sort of grassroots activism, keeping an eye on town meeting minutes, um, filing FOIA requests, and finding out what police departments are doing and trying to stop new surveillance activities before they start. On the same thread of 100% uh, um, 
spying on us 100% of the time, 100% of the locations we go. Is there, I think everybody in the room here is, is concerned about that, but the general public who has, quote, nothing to hide, end quote, is not because they truly believe that they have nothing to hide. And so how do you bring to their emotion, uh, to them, the emotion that is important to stop this politically? Uh, sure. Uh, so I mean, this is this has been a, a notion that's been around for a long. You know, nothing to fear. You have nothing to hide. Uh, and I think that that as like a threshold level, that uh, for the most part, uh, people do have something to hide. They they may not be thinking of it uh, right away, or or uh, they may think basically the the hidden assumption under the nothing to hide is that the current set of government is just fine, and I'm not too worried about. Uh, but if that government changes, uh, maybe you do start to have something to hide. If, if, uh, and we've seen, uh, you know, all around the world, there have been circumstances where governments have changed in their character rather suddenly, uh, and then the tools of the surveillance state are now available to people that you don't agree with. And we saw that uh, here, where there was a, a, an interesting shift in uh, a who liked surveillance and who didn't like surveillance when it, uh, the uh, warrantless surveillance program shifted from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. Uh, some people shifted their views about whether it was a good idea. Uh, I want to say is actually whether it's a good idea is a matter of, of civic hygiene, that you don't want to have the tools of the surveillance state available, uh, even if right now you don't feel like you have something to hide. But that's all right. Even if you find people's, like, no, seriously, I have nothing to hide. Uh, I am the most honorable person you could ever imagine. Uh, that that you know, okay, maybe that's true. Maybe you are uh, wonderful. Uh, but you have an advantage in society when other people are able to hide things, when a source is able to talk to a reporter and uh, uh, give information. Whistleblowers can come forward without having to fear retribution for their whistleblowing. The fact that other people have privacy from surveillance benefits society and allows us to have a more open democracy. So it's not just about yourself and whether you have something to hide, but what kind of future we want to have and what kind of society we want to live in. So uh, I'd like to invent maybe a sort of corollary to Schneier's law, which is that anybody can invent a crypto system so good that they can't break it. But you need to invent a crypto system so good someone else can't break it, and that's much harder. Similarly, anyone can live a life such that they can't think of anything that they have to hide, <laughs> but living a life such that the government can't find anything that you have to hide is much harder. <laughs> um, and I, I also want to push back a little bit. Uh, people like outside of this room, um, even outside of the other uh, rooms, uh, do care about this. And sometimes they don't always know that what they care about is privacy, um, but they do care about their, uh, their right to associate and they care about um, freedom of speech, even if they don't, uh, you know, the, the Snowdenism is, uh, not caring about privacy because you have nothing to hide is like not caring about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. Um, but but you know they pe people do care and they and they actually do connect to this and and if you look at you know I I, I don't want to uh, uh, lean too heavily on this but there are polls out there that suggest uh, that a lot of people care about issues that we consider privacy issues so it's there's there's a temptation to to write that off and, and go into privacy nihilism mode. Um, but, but this is something that people, even outside the, the uh, hacker community, uh, care about and are, and are paying attention to. So but now that we've, we're starting to reach a point where privacy issues are, are actually cutting into the bottom line of, of in the industry's interests, have you seen corporations, uh, are, have they, been willing to lobby on behalf of these issues? And does the EFF itself engage in lobbying? And lastly, um, do you think that we could see a reality where Fourth Amendment issues becomes the same kind of third rail political issue that Second Amendment issues are for politicians? All right, so uh, a number of questions there. Um, so I guess uh, on on one uh, I'll, I'll hit on one of those, which is you you asked about does uh, does EFF lobby and do the, the corporation lobby. So EFF does a little bit of lobbying as a uh, nonprofit organization, a 501c3. Uh, we, there are actually limits on how much uh, lobbying we can do uh, and maintain our nonprofit status. Uh, so we we do some. 
uh, and it's mostly in the form of grassroots lobbying. Uh, Vivian was mentioning our, our action center, and that is a way that people can go and uh, reach out to their uh, representatives. Um, and then, did you work on the Democracy Tools uh, project at all? Do you, do you know about that one? I do, but I haven't worked on it. All right, well, you can explain what, what Democracy Tools are and... Um, Right. Democracy Tools is another site that basically allows other people to uh, set up something for contacting uh, their, their representatives. So uh, this is sort of more in, a, in enabling others to, to do this. Uh, that, uh, well, I guess you can use them for whatever you want, but hopefully they'll, they'll be uh, in, in the right direction. And then with respect to the, uh, the companies, um, we've seen actually uh, several of the companies uh, get get active. Um, I mean, Apple has been very vocal on uh, no backdoors, uh, standing up to uh, a lot of government pressure to put backdoors into their encryption. And uh, um, during the NSA uh, surveillance, uh, um, after after the Snowden leaks, uh, really brought a lot of things into the public consciousness. Uh, a group of companies were, were pushing back uh, uh, heavily against the, against the surveillance. Uh, there was a, a group of major companies like Apple and Facebook and Google that formed a coalition. They took out a full page ad in, uh, I think it was the Washington Post. Um, so there has been some, uh, some activity. Um, you can find a lot more widespread agreement among corporations that there should be uh, strong limits on government surveillance. Um, and uh, perhaps less so on uh, limits on what corporations can do. Uh, oh boy, and the, the other question about the uh, Fourth Amendment being like the Second Amendment in terms oh, of yeah. the third rail. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, it's, it is uh, on a lot of the issues that we work on. I think the First Amendment's kind of like this too. Um, people, a lot of people care about it a little. Like there's a lot of people who uh, you can do something that they'll find creepy or you can restrict their speech in a way that they uh, won't like, but it doesn't happen that often to them. And, uh, and so it's, it's rarely s uh, a group of people's number one issue in the way that, that I think um, gun ownership is for a lot of people, or at least the NRA has done a really good job of uh, giving the impression that, that that's the case. Um, and, uh, and you know, I think it will bubble up people's priority list uh, as more and more of our lives are lived uh, online and around technology. Abuses of that technology um, are going to be more and more important to people. And when it becomes someone's top priority or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people's top priority, then yeah, it does get to be a, a, a political third rail and we can only hope. I have heard, by the way, on, on the Hill that, that uh, when, so the, they're, they've been talking about new copyright legislation basically since SOPA was, was defeated. Um, and they say, they use the phrase like, oh, we can't do that, it would get SOPA'd. Um, <laughs> and so I do, like, you know, I think, I think a show of force every once in a while uh, does remind them that like, oh yeah, we, <laughs> uh, there are voters out there. And <laughs> And if you piss them off, it's not good for, for the next election. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that we get there uh, in bits and pieces. Um, and, uh, and you know, it doesn't have to be people's top issue for it to be something that uh, EFF can rally people around. I think that's an important part of our role. Unfortunately, in this country, I think uh, for it to reach critical mass, it usually has to end up being about commerce. So you know, I, I would hope that we could kind of get that momentum around commerce uh, the way the NRA has done where they've kind of put together their grassroots activists with the manufacturing base and uh, you know whether you like what they've done or not I think it's been a successful model thank you yeah. thank you thank you hello all of you thank you for doing what you do and thanks for a really great discussion today um, my question is uh, DRM versus GPL. I'm just curious about some comments. I know some people who really love the GPL, both uh, version 2 and version 3, and I know those same people also really love the Apple Store. So the question is, um, why can't we, or maybe we can, put uh, GPL code in the, in the App Store? I think if you read the Apple fine print carefully, they don't care. In fact, if you read to the end, they even say, hey, if you don't like our license, um, 
replace it with one that you like. So, but it seems like uh, they do get upset when a community posts code and there's internal disagreement in that community. So that's one thing. Uh, and this is a little ramble on question. I'm partially asking this to help formulate the right question. But uh, the other comment is, it seems like the GPL in some ways is out of date. And it, it may be controversial, but it was built in a world where we had desktops and source didn't move very freely. Whereas now source is everywhere. We have you know, GitHub, uh, m any number of ways to distribute the source um, uh, explicitly or surreptitiously. So if something's under DRM, that's not gonna limit people's ability to uh, examine or use that source. So back to the first question, what do you think? Is it okay to put GPL code in the App Store? Um, I super love being in a room where you can ask about DRM v GPL, and people are like, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, it doesn't happen to me that often. Uh, can you put GPL code in the App Store? I mean, I mean people do. <laughs> I, mean, I, yeah, I, I haven't looked at the App Store agreement uh, uh, recently enough or closely enough to, to like, come to a conclusion on that. Um, you know, we, we ended up not, we, you know, EFF has an app. We didn't, we didn't put it in the App Store because we had some uh, uh, issues with uh, how that agreement was. So we chose not to do the agreement with Apple that would were requ required if you want to use the App Store. Uh, so it's possible that uh, some of the GPL product, uh, projects also have concerns about uh, just the, the agreement you have to have with Apple as opposed to the agreement that you would end up having with your, with your end users. Uh, but I, I don't know. Well, also, you know, for fear of stating the obvious, you know, the per pernicious part of DRM in the App Store is not so much that it prevents you from reverse engineering your app. You know, the source might be provided through another channel. The pernicious part is that Apple gets to choose what apps you're allowed to run on your phone and which apps you're not. And so it's sort of the DRM built into the iPhone inherently that only allows you to run apps from the App Store. Sure, yeah. I think that's very important. I would see that as a separate issue that requires its own adjudication, but also okay. very, very important. Um. And yeah, in terms of the, the updating, I, you know, th that's, <laughs> that's an FSF question. Um, and, uh, and I do think, you know, they, they've given thought to that um, and, uh, and we could have a long conversation. This actually probably, uh, I think we're having a, a, a sort of happy hour thing later. Nice. Um, maybe find me and I'll, I'll rant to you about the GPL there. <laughs> one, one last teaser thought, and maybe we start some discussion outside of this panel. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is this notion of a terminal binary, a binary that cannot reproduce itself. So really that means you've removed it so far from the source that, or you've changed it in some way, whether that's even possible. I, sort, I guess you see that with the App Store, you put something there, but you can never, uh, you can never, you can't download it and then modify it. You have to replace it. So what the App Store represents is this collection of terminal binaries. Um, but at the same time, they could be attached with source code. Um, anyways, I'm just there's a large community and um, that's interested in this and just trying to weigh the balance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Also, just to bounce off Parker's comment a bit, if you're interested in the EFF Speakeasy, come to the booth downstairs for details. Yeah, that's what I was. The Speakeasy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was looking for. Hi there. Um, really great and important work. Uh, my question on the heels of this is a bit more banal. Um, on Amazon, smile at .amazon.com, EFF is one of the nonprofits you can choose to donate money to. Do you actually make money from that? Is that helping you? I mean, some. Yeah, we get a little bit from that. Um, Definitely do. And it. that's yeah, it's it's like a it's a they give one percent I think to the to the charity that you pick. Yeah. Is it half? Yeah. Half a percent. Right. Yeah, and we do. I I I I have actually heard that we see like. I mean, it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna make the budget, uh, <laughs> but you know it, it's. It's better than uh, better than nothing. But uh, if you're interested in, in helping EFF, uh, one of the great ways to do so is becoming a member. Because in addition to uh, donating some money, which helps us, uh, uh, you know, uh, do our operations, uh, it is very useful when we're when we're going to uh, uh, Congress to say we you know we support this issue, we oppose this issue. Uh, when we're uh, filing a brief before a court saying that we're we're uh, you know. Uh, a good spokespeople on this issue to say how many members we have and have that number be large. So uh, uh, please, uh, if you have some moment, go downstairs, become a member of EFF. Uh, you can do it for a wide variety of donation levels, uh, and uh, uh, getting a higher number of members is very helpful to our doing our mission. Hi, um, thank you guys for 
actually existing in our lives because many You're of welcome. us are clueless of what we wouldn't Thank do you. without you. My question that needs real clarification for the room, however, is a word that gets thrown around a lot in society. Would you please tell us the definition of privacy? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, well, I think a lot of people might have different definitions of it. One of the definitions uh, that, that I like, it's been actually been around for, for a long time. It came from uh, an article about privacy, I think, uh, uh, almost, but not quite 100 years ago. But it's the right to be left alone. Uh, that, it, that it's not just about uh, uh, keeping uh, things secret, but having someone not be in your business. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's other views of privacy. I mean, you can achieve privacy by you know going off and, and living in a, in a cabin in the woods with uh, off the grid and no no correction. And maybe that, that, that is it's privacy. Not legal advice. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, uh, that is only one form of privacy. And people also want to have a form of privacy where they get to have some choices in whether their information is shared. Uh, that it can go to to their friends, uh, but not be uh, uh, shared to the entire world or to the government. Uh, so it's a little bit as well about uh, control of your personal personal information. Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, for me, there's a piece of it that has to do with consent too um, that I'm really interested in, um, where you know, sort of speaking to the point of. Uh, people who don't feel like it's important to them. And I think we named a lot of ways where maybe it is in, in ways that, that aren't immediately obvious. But I think that there's also a piece where um, you should be free to choose. You know, Even if um, there's information that you're comfortable sharing, I think there's a piece of it where uh, the, there's like a loss of control that people experience when um, they don't get to choose. And peop some people feel like, well, you know, I just don't really think this is up to me anymore, what people know about me. And um, holding that control is something that I'm interested in. And I think, um, you know, the fact that it's so hard to define speaks to a deep issue that privacy is a very abstract ideal. And it is oft it's hard to get people fired up about because it's so abstract. Um, and I think that's a challenge we face in activism in our particular communities, finding better ways and more specific ways to frame very specific problems we're talking about. You know, instead of privacy, maybe say Fourth Amendment violations or say, you know, non-consensual web tracking, which is how we talk about it with Privacy Badger, or say security. You know, um, I think the enemies of encryption would like to say, well, there's privacy on the one hand and there's security on the other, but they're the same and you need one to provide the other and vice versa. Um, and so I think when we talk about those more concrete ideas, it's easier for people to get excited about them. All right. Hello. Uh, my question is about the Let's Encrypt, sort of specifically the certificate error when your mail server is running Let's Encrypt and you open your mail client and you get the certificate error. And more generally, um, if, uh, you know, the future of is there still like work being done, is that going to you know, keep going into? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, uh, I would love to help diagnose your certificate error, um, either at the speakeasy tonight or possibly at the workshop tomorrow. Uh, I think you know it would require a bunch of back and forth that's not necessarily applicable to everybody. Um, there's definitely a lot more work going on in Let's Encrypt. You know, uh, so EFF and Mozilla came together with some sponsors to create an independent, long-running organization to maintain it. Um, I'm still do, uh, doing work for EFF on it. We still have a very active CertBot team. So some of the most important work there is scaling it out. Um, I said we have four and a half million certs now. Uh, my talk on Sunday is titled The Next Billion Certificates, which is how many we're going to have to issue to encrypt the whole web. So you can see there's a big gap between now and then. Um, and also in the CertBot world, we're always trying to make it easier and faster and work better for more situations. OK, we have one more minute. I think we try to lightning round the very last question. All right. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Yeah, you come and fight. We'll be at the booth. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Lynn Ulbricht. My son is Ross Ulbricht, um, the defendant in the Silk Road case. And you guys actually wrote it. Um, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, 
You guys wrote, uh, supported uh, an amicus brief about uh, the general warrants that were used uh, for his laptop and um, social media, and um, because it didn't, honor, it, it was unconstitutional because there was no particularity, which is part of the Fourth Amendment. Um, so, what in a couple of cases now, and they did it in, in Ro the response to Ross's appeal, they say, well, it doesn't really matter if the warrant is um, constitutional because we did it in good faith. They're using a good faith argument. It's being uh, upheld by the courts. And you know, I'm like, well, okay, so if I get stopped by a cop for speeding, I can just say, well, hey, it was in good faith. I, you know, I'm, I'm, or, or if I'm running a website, in good faith. So um, in any case, I, I just wondered about your comments because I'm concerned about it. It seems like it's, you know, on the Fourth Amendment's really in trouble. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, a, a challenge um, that, uh, uh, you know, courts, um, a lot of the judges come from the background of being a prosecutor. They are uh, of a starting point of uh, being sympathetic to, to prosecutions. And sometimes they will say something. I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of actually doctrines along these lines that say, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't have done that, but it's fine. And, you know, they're, 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 you know so, uh, that they acted in good faith. Uh, that uh, uh, that's harmless error. We would have found, you know, inevitable discovery. Would have found this anyway. Um, and, and this is um, uh, a, a tendency you find in courts. Though um, I think uh, there there there's uh, been some pushback. I um, mean, one of the things that uh, I think has been uh, good over the last several years uh, has been that the, the Supreme Court has been looking more critically at, at some of these things. You know, there there was a. Um, some, some commentary in a, in a couple of cases, sort of like you know, where the court was recognizing, look, you know, if, if, if you uh, got rid of the, you know, uh, exclusionary rule, yeah, you, you catch a lot more people, but there's something more important going on here. It's not just about the maximum effectiveness. I think we are, we're very much running out of time, so let's- Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, right. um, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, we're gonna be down at the, the booth uh, downstairs and then uh, come down there to find out about our uh, speakeasy tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um.